Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Discussion With program with the Museum on Maine. Um, my name is Sarah Schaefer, and I am the Director of Education at the Museum on Maine, and I'm so excited to be welcoming you all to this program. I'm very excited about it. I think it's an important program. It's going to be really informative and interesting. Um, my job is to not only welcome you live, but if any of you will be watching this um, after the live stream, um, I want to welcome all of you, and thank you for joining us after the fact as well. So our program today is, or tonight rather, is a discussion with Olivia San Juan, who is with us on Zoom tonight. Um, and her program, her discussion with, um, she is the president of Zone 7, and um, her program is Tri-Valley Water Supply and Demand, Managing Our Most Precious Resource. Um, and so we're going to be, she's going to be doing that presentation, and then we'll have a discussion with her where you guys can ask questions. If you see in the live, um, there's next to the kind of the video that you're seeing on YouTube, there is a live chat section. So please, as the presentation is going, please put your questions in there. And uh, we have a very special technical assistant who will be feeding those questions to us so that we can get those answered for you. Um, so please be doing that or just your comments or questions, whatever you like, put them there. Um, and the reason we're, we're doing this program, I just want to kind of give you a framework. So this is an important program, regardless of what we're doing at the museum, but we're particularly have been focused on water for so long these last um, couple months, it seems like, um, because we have right now the Smithsonian's uh, traveling exhibit. They have a program, the Museum on Main Street, and they travel shows to, to museums all over the country. And we have their waterways program right now. This is actually the last week of it. Not that it necessarily matters because we are closed, <laughs> so you can't necessarily come and see it, but we do have tours um, and small snippets on this YouTube channel. So um, after this is done, if you haven't checked out the exhibit, you can go and see Ken, our curator, is actually, um, he does little 10 to 15 minute little talks about sections of the gallery, um, and we show you, kind of highlight it, and then we also show you some of the graphics. So that's why we're focused so heavily on water right now. Um, and the exhibit goes over how water is so important to all the different channels of our life, whether it's economy, ecology, like social, cultural, it covers everything. Just like, I mean, water is a huge part of our life um, in a lot of different ways. So that's what the exhibit's about. That's why we're focusing on water. So this is our second water-related program that we're having as, as part of this exhibit-themed programming. So thank you, Olivia, for joining us. Um, I do want to introduce her, her and then I'm going to hand it over to her to kind of uh, take over. So um, Olivia San Long is president of our Alameda County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, also known as Zone 7 uh, Water Agency. So she was first elected to Zone 7 in 2018, and she's especially passionate about sharing her knowledge about the agency and planning for droughts and floods. So, um, she's really focused and, and excited about that, and you'll be able to tell that from her presentation, I already know. So um, her presentation, as we kind of touched on, will provide an overview of water supply and demand in the Tri-Valley region. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Olivia, and then I'll be back for questions. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. It's so great to be a part of this programming, and I know it's Still, you know, we're still living in this world of social distance. So we're giving this a try for our second time around with YouTube Live. And what I'm gonna do is share my screen and share some slides and do a presentation. And then we will have question and answer at the end. All right, so just give me a moment here to get the slides up and running. All right, I think we've got it. Okay, great. Um, Again, yes, hello everyone. My name is Olivia San Wong. I am currently serving as president of our Zone 7 Water Agency Board of Directors. And this presentation is focused on our Tri-Valley Water Supply and Demand. And I'll go through all of the great details uh, regarding how to manage our most pre precious resource, which is water. Okay, and let's see, there we go. Before we begin, I, I know that we're here on YouTube Live and this is the era of social distance uh, or the summer of social distancing. And before we begin, I, I do want to drive home this idea that hand washing, it's so critical for fighting COVID-19 and yet so many around the world lack access 
According to the United Nations, 2.1 billion people lack access to safe water. And I wanted to start the presentation today with this point so that we can appreciate all that we as a community have invested in to have our water system and to have our water supply, but also you know, look for ways to help support those around the world that don't have the same access to safe water. And I know organizations like the United Nations have been you know, really focused on this. I believe the Smithsonian exhibit at the Museum on Main right now, looking at waterways, also does touch upon this topic. And there are nonprofit organizations, such as if you go to the website water.org, that's an organization that was started by the famous actor Matt Damon, also really focused on trying to get um, more access to safe water for people. And it's so important now than ever before with this pandemic. Um, and so I, I really like to start with that message um, before we go into all that we've invested here in the Tri-Valley in regards to managing our water supply. So we're gonna start big picture and then we'll get down to the details here in our local area. Um, and here within California, our story in California really is the story of water. You'll see that when the Oroville Dam was completed, we basically were able to double our population in California since 1968. And it's that ability to you know, store water and move water and control water that has really enabled us to um, welcome so many people to California to call California home. And really this quest to find and move water, it's so essential to the California dream. And what I have here is such an interesting compare and contrast of that um, Orville, of Lake Orville, where the Orville Dam is. And you can see in 2011, when the lake was full and how much you know lush water resources we had. And then in the middle of our mega drought in 2014, Orville, Lake Orville was uh, you know, just that small amount of water. And so the message here really is, you know, we, we, we do our best to, you know, find and move water and to store water, but there is an element of mother nature involved and in whether or not we have, you know, snowfall in the Sierra mountains and the rainfall. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move through these, this presentation. I like to always share my water story, especially when I'm talking to folks from Pleasanton. My water story is so, grounded here um, in our town. I am an alum of Amador Valley High School. And here in the upper left-hand corner, I include a nice picture of our Arroyo del Val on the Centennial Trail, some cute ducks swimming around in the Arroyo. And I, I show this because when I was a freshman at Amador Valley High School, I was in Mr. Eric Teal's biology class and we started the environmental club at Amador Valley High School. And as a part of that environmental club, we, scheduled creek cleanups of this very creek here along the Centennial Trail. And that certainly helped shape and form, you know, my water story and my interest in being involved uh, in the Zone 7 Water Agency. At the same time, I also worked as a lifeguard at our City of Pleasanton Aquatic Center. And I am a regular um, swimmer. I swim a lot of laps, although not recently since I know our pool is still currently closed because of the pandemic. Um, however, you know, spending so much time in water also makes me appreciate it and think about it and know how important it is. And I, I can say personally, I really do miss being able to swim laps, um, but I understand uh, the need for us to fight this pandemic. On the right side, I, um, after I graduated from Amador Valley High School, I went to UCLA. And my first quarter at UCLA, I took two classes. The first class was water in Los Angeles. And here you have a great view of the California aqueduct as the water is flowing from the grapevine area into Los Angeles. And if you're driving north from LA back to Pleasanton, you usually get a very nice view of the California aqueduct. And many like to compare the California aqueduct as one of the most, uh, it's probably one of the best engineering feats of the 20th century. And we'll compare it to this aqueduct or this series of aqueducts in the lower right-hand corner in ancient Rome. And that was one of the other classes I took my first term at UCLA was a class on ancient Roman history. And through that, I actually got to then spend the summer between my freshman and sophomore year at UCLA in Rome, 
getting to tour some of the sites such as this one in the picture where I got to learn about all the amazing engineering achievements that happened in Rome, including the Roman aqueducts. And so many people do draw that parallel between our California aqueduct and the aqueduct of ancient Roman times. So as you can see, these things really shaped and formed my water story. And I really like to share that because I think it's such you know, an interesting thing. You never know what might influence you at such a young age. Fast forward to today, and starting in 2012, up until this, this past spring, um, I served on the City of Pleasanton Economic Vitality Committee. And it was such an amazing experience. Um, you know, the one thing that happened between 2012 and 2020 was that we were in our mega drought here in California from 2011 to 2017. And it was really during this time period on the Economic Vitality Committee, we explored and discussed, you know, how important water is to the local economy. And on this committee, we talked a lot about recycled water and more specifically, um, at the time we had the operations director from City of Pleasanton, Daniel Smith, join us at the EBC and we talked about um, you know, how we can invest in the recycled water project to help uh, alleviate some of the pressure on our local water supply. And so combining this water feasibility study from 2013 and you know, the work that Daniel Smith did with our committee, as well as in November 2014, California voters uh, voted in favor of and passed Proposition 1, which um, created money available for water projects, including $17 million for the Pleasanton Recycled Water Project. And all of this came together in August 2016 for um, a whole infrastructure of purple pipes through primarily Hacienda Business Park, as well as uh, what we now know as the Ken Mercer Sports Park. And that has really helped our water supply. And you'll see in a couple slides how it has helped our local water supply. And I'm really proud to have been part of the Economic Vitality Committee during this time period. At the time, you know, the executive director for Hacienda Business Park, James Paxson, was on the committee. And then I know Scott Rady from the Chamber of Commerce was there. And we had such an amazing conversation about how important the purple pipes, the recycled water in Hacienda Business Park would be for the landscaping and for the ability for Hacienda Business Park to maintain, um, you know, their current uh, visual um, effects <laughs> and, and also, you know, be water friendly. And so now if you're um, driving around town, you'll see anytime you see a purple hydrant or any sort of um, purple colored water, um, connection that signifies the recycled water. And so this all then led me to really want to join Zone 7. So that's part of my water story. Now in terms of history, I know at our first program uh, for this waterways series at the Museum on Main, um, Ken, the curator at the Museum on Main, really gave a thorough history of everything that's happened here in Pleasanton and the Tri-Valley area. And I can say I'm probably one of Ken's biggest fans. <laughs> and so it really inspires me too as I share this story about Zone 7 and water in the Tri-Valley region. And so I found this great map. It's from the ghostsofdublin.com website. And here you can see what our area looked like, um, the Amador Livermore Valley Gold Rush era from 1849 to 1865. And you can see we had this big willow marsh area as well as this lake. And I, I circled the Alviso Adobe just so you could get a frame of reference of you know, where this was located. And then you can also see all of our series of creeks and arroyos that would maybe flow into this marsh or you know, how all of this flows through the Amador Livermore Valley or what we now call the Tri-Valley region. All right. And the other piece of history that I really like to think about is, um, you know, what happened with San Francisco and San Francisco's quest to find water. And a lot of this happened after the 1906 earthquake. San Francisco was really um, acutely aware that they need to have a reliable source of water. And they had the Spring Valley Water Company 
And one of the proposals in 1912 was to actually flood the Amador Livermore Valley where we live now and make this the main reservoir for San Francisco. And so this was a proposal in 1912. You can get this map, you know, this map's available um, in terms of the proposal. And it was presented to the Secretary of the Interior as well as the Advisory Board of Engineers of the United States Army. This proposal was brought forth in 1912. And I don't think it was very long lived. However, it's, it's an interesting piece of history because the Tri-Valley as we know it today, you know, had this proposal gone through, it, we wouldn't have the community that we have. And so I, I find it to be really interesting history as well because what ultimately happened for San Francisco is they flooded Hetch Hetchy and that's the main reservoir now for San Francisco water. And Hetch Hetchy was flooded with the construction of the O'Shaughnessy Dam um, between 1919 and 1923. So you can see how this is all connected in that same time period. And you know, the other piece of history in terms of our shared California history that I really find fascinating is the story of John Muir. And I know um, there's some current debate about John Muir. I'm not gonna get into that today. However, John Muir was the first um, person featured on our California State Quarter back in 2005. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, he is best known or he got, he started the Sierra Club because he did not want Hetch Hetchy to be flooded and to be San Francisco's reservoir. So I think it's so interesting that um, at least back in 2005, you know, we celebrated John Muir here in California, yet he was very much opposed to what San Francisco ultimately did in regards to flooding Hetch Hetchy. And I also like to show this slide because, you know, again, going back to my earlier point that the story of California is really the story of water. Here you can see locally in the San Francisco Bay Area, that's the case for sure. Okay, so now we'll fast forward to 1955. You might recall that gold rush era map where I showed the marsh and the lake. You know, I always have a saying and it comes from one of my favorite movies, Jurassic Park, nature will find a way. And in 1955, we had the great flood here in the Tri-Valley and you can see the flood waters here in the background. And really that flood, the, the water aggregated where the original marsh and lake were located back during the gold rush era. And, um, you know, I think this is really important to note. And this also was what uh, led to the creation of Zone 7 Water Agency and what we have today. And so my next slide has a nice uh, history timeline about everything that we did. Um, it, it does give a little bit of um, the history before the major flood, but really it was that 1955 great flood that was shown on the previous slide that led to the creation of Zone 7 in 1957. And Zone 7 was created in 1957 because voters wanted local control of our flood protection and water resource management here in this area. And two of our first board members were Carl Wente and Joseph Concanon. As you know, in Livermore, we do have a very robust um, wine growing region. And certainly that also helped drive the efforts to want to have this local control um, you know, for flood protection and water resource management. So our name, I, I, I get a lot of comments, um, especially when I uh, leave the Tri-Valley region about what is zone seven. And so uh, within Alameda County, Alameda County has a flood control and water conservation map based on all of the flood plains throughout the county. And each district is broken up based on those floodplains. And so zone seven is one of many districts within Alameda County. And so then in 1957, when the Tri-Valley voters decided that we wanted to have local control of our um, flood control protection programs, as well as our local water supply, uh, it was the entire zone seven region that decided to break away from the Alameda County Flood Control and Water Conservation Districts. And so that's how we have our name Zone 7. And to best summarize what we do today at Zone 7, um, it's these three areas, water quality, water reliability, and flood protection. 
And today I'm really focusing more on the water reliability portion. However, when we get to Q&A, if you do have questions about the other two areas, I'd be happy to answer them. I, I just, you know, in terms of timing and in terms of the um, focus of this presentation, I did not include slides on those two other areas. And then this slide gives us a few more details about what zone seven is. It's um, pretty repetitive in terms of what I just mentioned in regards to flood protection. Um, I'm gonna get into more of these details as we go on through the presentation. So um, what we can do though is possibly have these slides be available for you if you'd like to have access to this information and review it a little bit more closely. I personally like to share what my elevator pitch is for zone seven. And really at zone seven, we plan for droughts and floods. And when thinking about droughts and floods, that really is a matter of predicting the weather. And my undergraduate degree is in applied mathematics. And as an applied mathematician, we spent a lot of time, or I spent a lot of time thinking about predictive models and forecasting. And certainly weather forecasting is one of the primary areas where there's been a lot of investments in satellites, as well as computer technology, as well as some of the algor algorithms that are used to give us those five day forecasts. And one of the things that we learn in mathematics when thinking about prediction is that, especially weather prediction is that, okay, we can predict the weather pretty accurately tomorrow and possibly two days out. And this cartoon really helps capture it. But as we get to five days out, the five day forecast is much less stable. And that has a lot to do with what's known as chaos theory or the butterfly effect, which I have um, visualized here on the right. And really what that um, stands for in a summary, and certainly you could take full you know, courses on this topic as I have, um, but really those initial conditions, just the slightest change in the initial condition can then set off a completely different outcome. And it's called the butterfly effect because um, there's a saying uh, that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, that can lead to a tornado in Texas. And, and so really at zone seven, we try to take a lot of, you know, the science and really do our best to help plan for droughts and floods, but it's still very dependent on the weather and there's so much variability. And, you know, right now in 2020, we're getting new research from some of our universities here in California, such as UC Davis, that's talking about how we can expect increased rainfall variability that's going to lead to more extreme wet years as well as more extreme dry years, which means that the years that we have rain, we're gonna have a lot of rain, and the years that we're not gonna have rain, we're not gonna have very much rain at all. And so when planning for that, we need to invest in ways to store water. We need to invest in other mechanisms so that we can have a reliable source of weather. And I'm gonna get into more of those details in the next couple of slides. All right, so what we look like today is on this slide. This is our current water supply. And we import the majority of our water supply. It is not local. We are part of the state water project. That means we get 70% of our supply from the Delta. And earlier I did talk about the recycled water project in Pleasanton specifically, but certainly DSRSD within Dublin and San Ramon, as well as the city of Livermore through their sanitation department also have recycled water services. So that's what's included in the nine, almost 10% uh, purple slice of this pie here. Um, and I'll, I'll, I have another slide, uh, it's either the next slide or in two slides that will show how um, when we have excess surface water, we artificially inject the surface water into our groundwater basin um, so that we can save that for future dry years. And then there's a whole system, uh, you know, as a state water project contractor where we can actually store water in Kern County as well as the San Luis Reservoir. And it's a banking system. And um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And if you have more questions, that's certainly something you could bring up in Q&A. Or you know, if I know you personally, if you wanna have a conversation about it, I'd be happy to do that too as well. Um, and then again, here on the slide, so we have 70% from the state water project and then that 10% is coming from our groundwater basin. But as I mentioned, the groundwater basin water is um, 
the surface water, the excess surface water from previous time periods, previous years that we inject into the groundwater basin and then we pump that when we need it. And so 80% um, of the Tri-Valley area um, is serviced with water supply from zone seven. Here's a really great visualization of the state water project. And this does include that California aqueduct that I mentioned earlier on the grapevine um, to help bring water to Los Angeles and the rest of Southern California. Um, we are a part of that same system. And here you can see, um, so there's a nice statewide map here that shows all of the uh, state water project areas, including zone seven. And we, we, we uh, have a nice, uh, zoom in of the zone seven areas so you can see how um, we're on what's called the South Bay Aqueduct. So this is um, where the water will separate from the California Aqueduct that goes down to Southern California and on the South Bay Aqueduct. We here at zone seven, we're the first stop and the Del Val Reservoir is really where we um, store a lot of our water from the South Bay Aqueduct. And the Del Val Reservoir is the same as the Del Val Park that you might enjoy. Um, Del Val Reservoir is actually managed by the Department of Water Resources by the state of California. It's not managed by Zone 7 or East Bay Regional Parks. However, the recreational facilities at Del Val are managed by East Bay Regional Parks. And for those of you that ever take a boat or some other type of um, water uh, sport activity item into the water, you know that there's a really um, strict process for making sure that there isn't anything that could potentially contaminate Del Val Reservoir. And that's because that is our main um, reservoir for our drinking supply here on the South Bay Aqueduct. So zone seven, we're the first stop, Alameda County Water District, which, which, services, most, which services all of Fremont is the second stop. And then the Santa Clara Valley Water District is the final stop and that services most of Silicon Valley. So we're all in this together. And I can tell you that we have a good working relationship, Zone 7 and our other two South Bay Aqueduct agencies. And we do try to have regular meetings both at, um, I think our staffs definitely talk a lot but then also at the board of directors level. All right. And so then this, you know, I, I already talked a little bit about Lake Del Val uh, State Water Project Facility, but um, this just gives you a nice summary of everything I said, and it's a good visualization. Um, so Lake Del Val is so vital for our water supply, and I think it's important to, to, to be um, aware of Lake Del Val and to also uh, acknowledge all of the different um, entities that are involved. In terms of Zone 7, all of our um, facilities are highlighted here on this map. And I'm going to close this. And you can also see that we've had two major capital projects over the past couple of years. I'm really excited to announce that our Del Val Water Treatment Plan Ozonation project has completed, and we have started using it as of last week, I believe. And what this does is this is used to help improve our water quality. Um, it's a technology that cleans the water and also helps to get rid of um, contamination such as algae, which, um, you know, algae has been a global issue in terms of water supplies and we're not immune to some of the issues with algae and ozonation is really helping us to, to manage that threat from algae. So that Del Val water treatment plant is located right next to Lake Del Val and it's now operating. Um, we are also doing the same at our Patterson Pass water treatment plant and that should open in the next couple of years. And then in terms of the other facility that I wanna highlight, we also have here in Pleasanton, the Mocho groundwater demineralization plant and that's at the corner of Santa Rita and Stone Ridge. And this slide, goes into a little bit more in depth of the previous slide in regards to all of our water facilities. So our surface water treatment plants at Del Val and Patterson Pass, you know, the Mocho groundwater demineralization plant for when we pump water from the ground. We also have 40 miles of pipelines and pump stations to move water around the Tri-Valley region. And then we are also really focused on groundwater recharge. As I mentioned earlier, we inject the excess surface water into our groundwater basin and that enables us to have access to that water supply during dry periods. 
Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this SGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Authority that's gonna be on a, I think either the next slide or on two slides. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we are managing our groundwater. Ah, it is the next slide, good. All right, so this is, um, so in 2014, the same time that we passed Proposition 1, Governor Jerry Brown also um, helped lead the efforts to pass the Sustainable Groundwater Management Authority Act. And the reason for this is during our mega drought during that time period from 2011 to 2017, we saw that a lot of um, different parts of California were pumping too much water out of the ground and we need to have a plan for how to better manage our groundwater. And so that's what happened in 2014. We at Zone 7 were leaders in regards to um, you know, getting our plans uh, submitted to the state of California. We are the exclusive agency to provide oversight of our Livermore Amador Valley groundwater basin. And that was accepted in December of 2016. So about two years after the act passed. And then um, through that, we had to submit another report, the Alternative Groundwater Sustainability Plan for 10 years, for the next 10 years. And we were one of the first agencies to receive approval of this about a year ago in July 2019. So it's really exciting that we're you know, leaders in the state of California in regards to um, managing our groundwater. And we have been even for a long time before this 2014 act. You'll see in 1962, we already started to notice what was that, five years after Zone 7 started in 1957, that we were taking a lot of water out of our groundwater basin and we were really depleting it to low levels. And so it was in 1962 that Zone 7 made the decision to do what's known as artificial recharge. And that's where we take that excess surface water from the state water project, from the water we get from the Delta and we inject it into our groundwater basin. And that then helps to make sure that we have a healthy supply of water available to us during the dry years. And I can say um, for sure during the mega drought from 2011 to 2017, if we didn't have the groundwater basin water available, we would have been in a much different situation here in the Tri-Valley. And this next slide shows um, you know, the, the state water project allocation that we receive from the Department of Water Resources. And you can see that the reliability is uh, not as certain as I think we at Zone 7 would like. In fact, the lowest allocation we ever received was in that same year, 2014. So you can see why 2014 was such a critical year in terms of planning for droughts. We only received a 5% state water project allocation at zone seven for water. And I believe that, you know, accepting that reality of 5% water allocation, it's really, um, you know, forcing us to now think about what are we gonna do in the long run? Because there's a very good chance that we may have another year where we have 5% allocation. In fact, this year we're at a 20% allocation. So it's not quite as low as 5%, but 20% is still pretty low. And so um, we, we, we do have to manage with a lower allocation from the state water project. Um, we are lucky that our groundwater basin is pretty much at capacity or was at capacity at the beginning of the summer. So we haven't had to have any strict drought um, requirements in terms of watering our lawns or conserving water. However, I, I think for all of us collectively, we, we can see that it's been a dry year. And I think we do need to think about water conservation because if we don't get a lot of rain in the next 12 months, next summer could be a very different type of summer with less water. Um, so I think it's something that we need to be mindful of and um, you know, talk about and consider as we're you know, making decisions that involve water. And it's not just drought, that's our only water supply challenge. Certainly drought and climate change makes um, you know, water supply less reliable here. You can again see how low our water supply was during that mega drought, but there's also water quality degradation. I know I talked a little bit about algae. You know, I, I've been reading a lot about algae recently and it's not just something that we're facing here in California. You know, all, a lot of states across um, our country, their, their water supplies are also facing algae challenges. And this is also happening outside the United States. Um, 
and certainly this is something that we need to be aware of. And this is where our ozonation plant that we just recently opened is gonna help us fight some of those problems with the algae. Environmental is also another um, important aspect of you know, our water supply challenge, as well as aging infrastructure. Um, you, you, you know, the, the Delta right now, it, it's, it's kind of getting to the end of its, its lifespan. And so we do need to think about what we're gonna do um, to, to make the Delta ready for the future, whether it's, you know, making sure that it's seismically um, built to withstand a major earthquake or, um, you know, just even making sure that it's in operation. So right now there's definitely a debate about what to do with um, the aging infrastructure of the Delta specifically, but it, it can also include things like the South Bay Aqueduct and other um, aspects of moving water around our state. Um, but within the Delta specifically, I know that we've had the debate about the twin tunnels, having two tunnels go under the Delta to bring the Sierra snow melt water to the California Aqueduct and the South Bay Aqueduct for us here at Zone 7. Right now, Governor Newsom is proposing a single tunnel, and I know there are groups such as the earlier mentioned Sierra Club that would prefer to see no tunnels. So this is definitely a debate that's happening right now, and it is really important here in the Tri-Valley that we stay attuned to this debate because that is our major source of water supply. And this slide shows, you know, all the things, all the projects, all the different um, groups that we're a part of to think about our water supply reliability so that we can better manage for future dry years. Um, so in terms of storage and emergency conveyance, we are a part of the expansion of Los, Ver Los Vaqueros Reservoir. And that's located right on the Contra Costa County, Alameda County line in Brentwood. And it, so that means it's really close to us here in zone seven as it borders Livermore. And being a part of this project, it's gonna really help us increase our water storage as well as um, our emergency conveyance as we will be building a pipeline that will help connect us to other regional agencies such as um, it looks like we might be able to be connected to East Bay Mud and Contra Costa Water District. So that, that can also be just as valuable. In terms of water supply, I mentioned Delta Conveyance Project. Um, this is what has also been known as Delta Fix in the tunnel proposal. So this is where we're trying to have better conveyance of the Delta system um, to, to you know, improve the infrastructure so that we can still you know, you get water through the Delta system going forward. Um, and then we have a few other projects that we're looking at, including potable reuse, regional desalination, sites reservoir and water transfers. And I, I'd be happy to go into any of these topics um, during our Q&A session or anytime after today too, you're, you're, you're welcome to reach out to me and I, I, we can have a conversation. Okay, so that's a lot about water supply, but you know, as, an, as, as someone who studies economics, I think about supply and demand, right? So we're trying to meet our supply with our demand. And with that demand, um, certainly we look at things like population, and we do have projected growth of population um, between now and 2040. And when we think about more people, that generally means more water demand. However, conservation efforts and you know, planning to use less water can help reduce that demand. And also, in, I think it was in 2014, at the state level, um, there was another initiative, Conservation as a Way of Life, that was passed where the state of California is now going to mandate conservation levels. And so we as a community, we are collectively making efforts to um, conserve water. However, we're also going to be required to conserve water by the state of California. So um, it, it's gonna all come together and um, we will use that as we start to continue to plan you know, where that water supply and demand intersection is. Um, so going on to the next slide, I, I want to include some data for those of you who are like me and like to look at numbers. And here's, um, you know, the, the tables that we use in regards to planning water supply and demand at zone seven. So we, we, we look at the total water supply available based on, you know, our table A allocations, so that's the state water project allocation. So you can see this year, 2020, it's 20%. Going forward, we typically 
plan for 49%. But of course, thinking about predicting the weather, we, we don't know for sure if that's what will be, but that's what we plan for because we want to be optimistic. And the reason why this summer we haven't had to um, ask for strict conservation from the community is last year in 2019, we did receive a lot of rainfall and we also received a 75% table A allocation from the state of California. And so that's really helping us this year in 2020 in terms of managing our water supply and meeting water demand. And then this is another great table that I like to look at in regards to our water supply and you know where where we have our water stored currently and also how it maps to the demands and like i said earlier i'll try to figure out a way to get you access to this slide deck through the museum on maine um, because some of you may want to look at these slides a little bit more closely and have access to the data points all these slides have been presented at one point or another during a zone seven board of directors meeting um, but I've collated these slides to tell this story about water supply and demand. So I think it would also be nice to have this slide deck available so you don't have to go through and look at maybe 20 different uh, presentations to get each one of these slides. Okay, so we're nearing the end of my prepared presentation. And so far I've showed you how, you know, we at Zone 7 were basically the interface between the state water project and the water retailers. And I haven't even addressed how water gets to the faucets at your home. And actually, if you think about it, when you pay your water bill, you don't pay zone seven, you actually pay here in Pleasanton, the city of Pleasanton, in Dublin and San Ramon, you pay the Dublin San Ramon Services District, DSRSD, and in Livermore, you either pay city of Livermore or Cal Water. And that's because we at zone seven, we don't deliver water to your homes, we deliver it to those retailers. And this next slide is a great map of zone seven and the four retail water providers that we service. And so there's a whole system and network of pipes that help bring the water from zone seven to your house. And in Pleasanton, for example, that series of pipes is managed by the city of Pleasanton. And that they, the city of Pleasanton also manages how much water you're using and that's how your water bill is calculated. And so it's getting us towards the end of my prepared presentation. Um, before I end, I do want to make sure you're all aware that we're having this amazing documentary that the worldwide premiere of Hometown Water, The Lifeline of Pleasanton. This was created by the Go Green Initiative um, with a group of interns who are students at Amador and Foothill High School or graduates of Amador and Foothill High School who are now in college. And it's going to be such a great um, overview of past, present, and future um, in regards to water here in Pleasanton. And I'm so excited that this was put together and it'll be interesting to compare, um, you know, what, what the students have been able to do versus, you know, me giving you this PowerPoint presentation, I think, um, what the students put together will be a little bit more enjoyable. And we're hoping that maybe you, you know, order a pizza or make popcorn when you join us on Saturday. So this Saturday, August 15th at 6.30 p.m., we're gonna be on this same YouTube channel that you're watching us on right now, the Museum on Main YouTube channel. We'll be live streaming this documentary. And not only will it be the worldwide premiere where we will live stream this documentary, but we will also have a Q and A uh, session after the documentary. So I'm, I'm really excited and I hope you'll join us on Saturday night. And so with that, I wanna thank you. I think we do have some questions. So I'm just actually trying to now figure out how I can see some of those questions. So <laughs> Olivia, we do have a lot of questions. Okay, um, so thank you for those who are participating live for sending those questions to us. So I'll just kind of go through from the beginning and we'll, it, it'll probably kind of follow the timeline, the, the, I guess timeline, I can think of another word, um, of your presentation. We're going to start with um, Tom Daggett. How does Zone 7 interface with other Bay Area zones? Is there a coordinated Bay Area response to water? 
Yes, there's definitely a coordinated Bay Area response in a number of different ways. Um, one way is, you know, I, I'm I'm personally very intrigued by the technology and the ability to have desalinated water where we um, take water from the ocean and remove all of the salt, the salinity, um, so that it becomes drinking water. And there is a regional Bay Area effort to explore and investigate the possibility of having a regional desalination plant here. And, and Zone 7 is very interested in being involved in that conversation and seeing if it's something that Zone 7 um, would want to continue to be involved in. And in terms of desalination, because I'm so interested in this topic, um, at one point I did have the opportunity to go to a California water conference in San Diego. And while at that conference, I did get to visit the Poseidon plant in Carlsbad, which is the largest um, desalination plant here on the West Coast. And what was great on that tour is we got to test the water. We got to try the desalinated water and it tastes amazing. Um, and so I think it's, it's great that all the different Bay Area agencies are working together on this. The Los Vaqueros project, which I mentioned earlier, is another good example of the Bay Area agencies coming together as a region to think about you know, additional storage as well as emergency conveyance. We're, we're gonna be better connected. Right now the plan is, um, you know, if, if everything that we're planning for at Los, Los Vaqueros goes forward, then zone seven will be better connected to East Bay Mud and Contra Costa Water District and potentially a few other water agencies through that Los Vaqueros project. And that's really good for all agencies involved so that if there is, you know, we always use an earthquake and as example, since we're here in the Bay Area, if there is a major earthquake and we need to help, you know, one of our partner agencies receive water, then having that connection could potentially be one way that we help um, get water to them. The other great example is the South Bay Aqueduct and the combination of the South Bay Aqueduct and Los Vaqueros Reservoir. So there is some interest from some other agencies um, who aren't currently on the South Bay Aqueduct to potentially be involved in Los Vaqueros and then also be involved with the South Bay Aqueduct to move water around the Bay Area. So uh, long story short, I think you'll see that all of us here in the Bay Area, we are coordinating efforts, talking to each other, and exploring the possibility of projects to see what makes sense for you know each of our regions. And I think, I think in the next ten years, you'll see this all come to fruition and us working together on these projects. Great. So our next question is also from Tom again. Where does the water that is recycled come from? How is it captured? Is there a plan to expand the purple pipe? into other areas? Yes. So the recycled water is, um, it, it does come from our wastewater. And more specifically here in Pleasanton, all of our wastewater um, does go to DSRSD to be processed. Um, and so with the purple pipes in Pleasanton specifically, so again, at Hacienda Business Park, at um, the Ken Mercer Sports Park, um, that water, the purple pipe water, that is our wastewater being recycled. And it's using a technology called reverse osmosis. And that's actually the same technology we have at the Mocho groundwater demineralization plant that we use to you know, help clean and treat the water from our groundwater. And reverse osmosis is also the same technology that's used for desalination. Um, I'll give you a side note as a UCLA alum, I will share that uh, reverse osmosis, the patent was uh, invented and submitted from UCLA. So it's a UCLA technology. So that's exciting for me as a UCLA alum. Just want to throw that out there. Um, in terms of expanding the purple pipes into other areas. So the purple pipe program in Pleasanton is actually run through the city of Pleasanton. So I believe our city um, employees as well as elected officials might be better to ask. However, I do like to stay on top of this topic so I can give you what I've learned um, more recently and then maybe we verify with them. Um, so there is an infrastructure in place should we have the ability to expand the Purple Pipe project. I know that there is a lot of interest in potentially getting the Purple Pipe infrastructure to be expanded all the way out to the city golf course. Um, that plan though, so, so, so the infrastructure is in place for that, but that plan, you know, it, it takes a lot to, to build the pipes and to get everything approved. And so I don't think that that plan has been greenlit in terms of it happening right now, but it's out there as a potential project. Um, it is dependent on DSRSD 
and the wastewater available from DSRSD. And DSRSD only has so much capacity to uh, provide recycled water. And I did just recently read, I think in one of our local papers, maybe the Independent, that DSRSD has issued a, a press release that um, right now they're not currently accepting additional recycled water projects um, because of the current capacity of their reverse osmosis system. Um, that doesn't mean that that can't change. So I think this conversation is still out there for us to have with each other. Uh, I imagine right now with the way city budgets are with COVID-19 and some of the other priorities we have right now with the pandemic, um, not that this isn't a priority, but that just hasn't been elevated quite yet. But people are talking about it. So I think we will hear more in the coming years. Okay. So we also have a piggyback to that question um, from Christina Nystrom. Um, has uh, the use of recycled water affected our landscape, positive or negative? Does it have any impact? Yeah, so there are a lot of regulations for how um, the purple pipes can be used for irrigation, um, especially when there's a playground or a picnic bench. The, the water can't touch the playground equipment or the picnic bench. Also, if there's a drinking fountain, the recycled water can't touch that drinking fountain. So when, for example, Ken Mercer Sports Park, where there are a lot of um, sports programs for children here in Pleasanton, when the recycled water um, was being put into the sports park to, to, to water, you know, the soccer fields and the grass there, there, there had to be a careful design to make sure that that water did not touch the drinking fountains or the playground equipment or the picnic benches that might be there. Um, in terms of affecting our landscape, so I mean, it certainly helps us maintain the green lawn during our drought years and our dry years. Um, and you know, it, it is actually pretty expensive <laughs> to have green lawn. And so I think that that does help us then, you know, maintain that asset so that if we do have another mega drought, we don't lose that lawn. Plus, you know, here in Pleasanton, we really do value our sports programs for young people and for adults too. And so it is nice to be able to have that green lawn available for those programs. Great. So it looks like we're moving on a little bit from um, the recycled water to um, what determines the percentage water allocation that we receive. So what determines it ultimately is the state of California Department of Water Resources. Um, however, it's, it's dependent basically on the Sierra snowpack. So when you see the, the news stories um, or the articles come out about the Sierra snowpack that directly affects our state water project allocation. So those years that we had no snow on the Sierra, those were the years that we had that 5% allocation. So for us here in Pleasanton, we have to always be rooting for snow on the Sierra because that makes our lives so much easier when there's snow on the Sierras. Yeah, not just for the skiing and the snowboarding, yes. and the <laughs> snow, snow trips up to the Sierras, but for also for our water. Um, all right, so then the next one is also from Christina. If our population grows, will we get a larger percentage of the allocation? What happens if our population grows? How will we ensure enough water? So the table A allocations, that was an agreement made many years ago. Um, and so that would have to be renegotiated if we wanted to get an increased percentage. And I, from what I understand, I don't think that that's our plan at zone seven to increase and in, to, to negotiate an increase in our percentage. So I think we, we at Zone 7 aren't planning to stay with what we have at the State Water Project. Um, and I wanna give you a little bit of the flip side of that. So we get our, uh, we have our Table A allocation from the State Water Project. When there's something like the Oroville Dam spillway, which, ha which started to um, crack during the mega drought and needed repairs, we at Zone 7, based on our table allocation, we actually had to pay our portion towards fixing the Oroville Dam. So what water we get from the State Water Project that also dictates what we have to pay back to the State Water Project for all of the infrastructure that's involved in getting the water you know, to us. And so increasing our percentage isn't always ideal because there's a cost involved in that. Um, and so that's why we're exploring other opportunities for our water reliability so that includes the sites reservoir project, for example, is a good one. Um, that's north of the Delta. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna capture 
um, storm water flows from the Sacramento River when we do have some of those extreme wet years. And, you know, looking at climate change, there's this idea that when we have some wet years, we might get more of these atmospheric rivers, which will cause an increase in rainfall, but maybe not give us as much snow in the Sierras. So what I like about sites reservoirs, it does help diversify how we're getting our water. So that if we don't have that snow in the Sierras, but we still have the rainfall, we'll be able to capture that rainfall and have access to that water um, to help us during those dry years. In terms of population growth, um, so we use that as part of that demand calculation to see how much more water we're gonna need in the future. And that helps us invest in projects like the sites reservoir. But we also hope that we will have more water conservation. And like I said, you know, we are trending to having more water conservation here in the Tri-Valley just in general as you know, consumers, but the state of California is gonna start to mandate water conservation on us as well through this water conservation is life program at the state level. And so I think increased conservation um, will also ensure that we, you know, meet those water uh, reliability, um, you know, targets. And, you know, there, there's also some things like, you know, you can get a water efficient washing machine. And we had some time, we actually have a rebate program for water efficient washing machines. So if you live within the zone seven region and you purchase a new washing machine, that's water efficient, you can apply for a rebate at zone seven and we will give you that rebate. And that's our incentive for people to conserve water. We also now have a, um, program native plant landscaping. So if you're looking to, um, you know, do some landscaping in your yard, you can look at native plants, which typically require less water. And that also then can help reduce some of that demand and help us conserve water. That's great to know about those programs as well. Um, all right, so our next one um, comes from, um, Christina again. <laughs> uh, does Zone 7 work with planning departments in the local cities to ensure enough water for new development? There is a coordination, I believe. Um, so, so we at Zone 7, we do not have land use authority. So we don't, as a board, vote on development projects. However, there is a process to make sure that the water is available and there is, um, for, for new developments, those new developments do need to get a permit from zone seven, uh, or not a permit, um, there, there is a step in the process where zone seven's involved. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we, we don't, we, we do ensure that there's enough water, but we don't actually have the final say in terms of whether or not a project goes through. So that, that really is up to each of the cities. And in fact, in regards to water demand, we get all the water demand data from the cities. And so then our job at Zone 7 is to make sure that we can meet that demand. So we, we, we did recently initiate a study so that we can help um, look at the demand in a common way across all of our retail districts. Cause we would get, you know, one set of data from Pleasanton, a different set of data from Livermore and then a third set of data from Dublin, San Ramon. And sometimes the data points didn't always line up. So we are working on that so we can have a better water demand model. But at the end of the day, those inputs for water demand, we get from the cities and then we go out and that's how we plan water supplies based on what the cities or the retailers tell us they expect to, the water demand to be. Okay. Uh, thank you. So our next question comes um, from Tom. Is our water supply at risk from a major earthquake? Do we have a backup plan if needed? I mean, I think there's always risks from a major earthquake. I hope uh, it's not um, a huge risk or that, you know, we'll be okay. You know, I take a lot of lessons from the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. It was after that earthquake, San Francisco realized that they need to have a more reliable supply of water. And that's why the San Francisco went out and tried to, you know, initially tried to use the Livermore Amador Valley to be the reservoir and then ultimately Hetch Hetchy. Um, I, I think that we used as much, you know, modern engineering techniques and planning techniques to be ready for a major earthquake because we do live here in the Bay Area where we expect to have an earthquake at some point. Um, but I also know that during the mega drought, what happened at the Oroville Dam wasn't completely expected. Um, and so that was something that we had to deal with at the time. Uh, luckily, um, 
that situation was caught and it didn't become such a such a major crisis. I mean, it was still something that needed to be addressed, but I think because we have such great engineering techniques and planning processes, we're able to meet um, the needs when they arise, such as Orville Dam. So I think when I look at something like what happened there, I, I feel very confident that should we have some you know major catastrophe, we'll be able to you know address it and be there. But that said, I, you know we, we know that the infrastructure in the Delta is aging. It is an aging infrastructure, and we do need to come up with a plan for it. We can't. We, we, if, if, we're, if we're at 2070, for example, in 50 years, and we haven't done anything about the Delta, then I think we've done a disservice to the next generations because there, it's unlikely that the current infrastructure of the Delta would be reliable in 2070. Yeah, I remember when we had our Delta uh, water exhibit, or it was a photography exhibit, but it talked yeah. about the Delta and the ecology, and it talked about how that is the aging infrastructure and the problems that, with the Delta. And, kind of like you're in a rock and a hard place with the Delta and how to proceed, so. So with the backup plan, um, you know, currently I think our groundwater basin is one of our best resources for that, right? Being able to pump water from the groundwater basin. I know in terms of emergency services, I've read that there's bottled water stored at the fairgrounds should we have no access to water supplies. Um, and then in terms of planning for that, I think the Los Vaqueros project, again, goes back to that. Um, backup plan. Certainly the Los Vaqueros project isn't ready right now, but, you know, we need to be planning again for this for the future in case something happens. All right, awesome. And then our last comment is not a question, but it just says go Bruins, which I can't Excellent. leave. I'm going to have to say go Ducks just in response to that. <laughs> okay. I know, I'm so sad. No Pac-12 football until I know. spring, maybe. But I think it was the right decision for our student athletes. I think so too. But yeah, that was that was a big announcement. Um, I think just that came out today, right? So yeah, recently. We digress. I know. This is um, about college football. <laughs> so um, I blame Jim, who wrote Go Green. Um, so um, are there any other questions out there for Olivia? Do you see any? I'm looking at our tech support. Does not look like that we have um, any, but um, we did get a thank you. This has been great. I learned a ton. I'm so glad. Um, and uh, you are welcome to the person who wrote that. Um, so thank you so much. And Olivia, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. This has been so informative. Um, I know I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody else did. Uh, water is a very complicated topic and it is essential for our life and um, just the survival of everybody on the most yeah. basic level. So um, so we really appreciate your time in explaining how the water here in our valley, the supply and the demand and the issues that we're facing. So thank you for your time. Thank you everyone. Um, we will see you all hopefully again. I know Olivia will be back on Saturday. So I'll be back on Saturday. That means all of you have to be back on Saturday. So we'll see yeah. you then for the Go Green Initiative um, documentary all about hometown water. So we'll see you then. Thanks for your time. Have a Bye, good day. Bye, everyone. Day. Bye.